you guys ever come across a true crime story that just sticks with you? It plays in your mind, you find yourself searching for updates every day, that kind of thing? Well, the story we're looking at today is kinda like that. This is one of the rare cases where a crime outside of the US captivated the whole whole world. And despite taking place over 10 years ago, it's still talked about today. In fact, one of the most memorable things about this case isn't the crime itself, but the social impact it had on society and how people responded to it. This is the case of Nevada Tan. The year was 2004, a time when social media was barely a thing and the internet was still run by forums and messaging boards. In the city of Sasebo town on June 1st, 2004, it looked like it was going to be any other day. That morning, the streets bustled with cars on their way to work and kids headed off to school. Nobody suspected that when they sent their child off to class that day, it might be the last time they'd ever see them alive. But that day, there were two families about to have their lives changed forever, Natsumi Suji and Satoshi Tormi Nitiari were both known to be good friends. They shared a lot of the same classes and played together on the school basketball team. However, what few people knew was that a feud had started between the two elementary school students just days before. Back in 2004, when you couldn't talk to your friends on social media, people made messaging boards to talk outside of school. They weren't nearly as sophisticated as social media apps that we have today, but they got the job done. This was also the birthplace of online problems. Satomi so had said some pretty nasty things to Natsumi on one of these boards, making comments about her weight and calling her a goody-goody in class. Now, kids fight all the time, right? I know I used to fall out with my friends all the time in elementary school over the dumbest stuff, but by recess, it was all totally forgotten about. That wasn't the case for Natsumi. What her mom didn't realize that morning when she kissed her daughter goodbye on the way to school was that Natsumi had a secret. In her pocket, she was carrying a concealed box cutter. The first part of the morning went on as normal. Both girls went to class and nothing seemed out of the ordinary until lunch break when Natsumi asked Satomi to come with her to an empty classroom. As soon as the two were alone, Natsumi lunged at the girl who used to be her friend. She stabbed her arms multiple times and eventually cut Satomi's throat, an injury that would result in the end of her life. <laughs> Natsumi stayed to watch Satomi die, standing over her as she bled out on the classroom floor. After she stopped breathing, Natsumi kicked her in the head just to make sure she was truly gone. Still holding the box cutter and covered in blood, Natsumi left Satomi in the classroom and returned to the one they had just came from, where everyone was still having lunch. When her class and teachers saw Natsumi covered in red, they all assumed she'd hurt herself. That was until she said, this is not my blood. Police were contacted immediately and they arrived at the scene in minutes. Nobody could believe what they were hearing. Obviously, murders occurred throughout Japan, but rarely did they happen in places like Sasebo and almost never by kids. When they arrived, they found that Natsumi had drawn the curtains to the classroom before she lured Satumi in. Satumi was found lying face down on the floor with no signs of life. The school had the task of making a very difficult call to Satumi's father, Koijoi Miti who rushed down to the school as soon as he could when he heard that his daughter was hurt. At the time, he didn't know the full extent of her injuries. Kaijoi was a widower and was raising his three children alone. After already losing his wife, Satumi's mom, to cancer a few years earlier, I can't imagine how awful this loss must have been for him. In an interview, he said that he couldn't imagine life without Satumi around, that she was like heir to him. When it came time to arrest Natsumi, she was reported to already severely regret her actions. She reportedly confessed to the crime on the spot and told the police that she'd done a very bad thing. She professed that she was sorry over and over again, and they took her into custody. Once down at the station, Natsumi refused to speak or eat any of the food offered to her by the officers. She just totally shut down. This was pretty frustrating for the officers who were eager to understand why she would do this to someone she used to be such good friends with. She spent the night at the station and could often be heard crying. The next morning, she finally accepted accepted some bread and juice and told the police why she had committed this awful crime. By this point, the media had gotten hold of the case and the details were spreading like wildfire. Hundreds of people offered their condolences to Satumi and her family. Others called for justice against Natsumi, who was known as Girl A in the media due to her age. In the two months before Natsumi's trial, investigators took a deep dive into her past and tried to figure out what would drive someone so young to kill another human being. Although she was thought to be a good student, 
there were several signs that Natsumi was having some difficulties. She loved playing basketball and had a healthy number of friends, but in recent months, things had started going wrong. Her parents were unsatisfied with her grades and as a result made Natsumi quit the basketball team to focus on studying. She was under a lot of pressure to maintain grades as well as participate in after school activities, which would be crucial in the future for her to get into good schools. But that wasn't all. Natsumi had gained an interest in dark media, cartoons and movies that definitely weren't appropriate for her age range. She was reportedly really into battle royale books, which are about a group of students who are trapped on an island and have to fight to the death so a lone survivor can leave the island alive. Psychologists also discovered previous incidents that Natsumi had had, including fighting other students and bringing a sharp object to school with her just a month before Satomi's murder. This started a real discussion around internet content and how parents could stop their children from accessing this kind of material. Although it's hard to say, if Natsumi hadn't found out about this stuff online, then it's possible she never would have thought to do what she did to Satomi. It's been suggested she may have been suffering from Hikikomi syndrome, which includes symptoms such as internet addiction, social withdrawal, and depression, but it was never confirmed. On September 15th, 2004, a Japanese family court ruled that Natsumi should be institutionalized. Despite not being diagnosed with any psychological illness, the severity of her crime led the court to overlook her age and consider how dangerous she was to a society, and if there was any hope she could be rehabilitated. Her original sentence was two years in an institution in Tochi, prefecture, but this was extended by a further two years at her hearing in 2006. In October 2005, Natsumi and Satomi would have been graduating from elementary school with the rest of their class. They were still awarded with graduation certificates. This was controversial as many believe Natsumi should not have received a certificate, but this was a move by the court who wanted to give Natsumi a chance to enter society as a proper citizen in the future. In 2008, Natsumi was released from the custody of the institution and placed under house arrest. In 2013, she was fully released into the care of her family, who moved to an unknown location in Japan and she continues to live as a free woman today, under a new identity and out of the public eye. But that isn't the end of the story. The reaction that Satomi's murder got in the media was weird to say the least. There was a lot of mystery surrounding the case, especially in terms of the girl's ages and Natsumi's identity. Although the public didn't know her real name, a photo of her had started to circulate around the internet, specifically one where she's seen wearing a University of Nevada sweatshirt. This got people to start calling her Nevada Tan. Tan is a cutesy variation of Chan, which means friend. People seemed totally fascinated by her and the fact that she'd done something so awful at such a young age. It was also rumored that she was wearing the Nevada sweatshirt when she killed Satomi. The topic of Nevada Tan became popular on messaging boards in Japan and across the rest of the world. People would draw cartoons of Natsumi wearing the sweatshirt and covered in blood, drawing her in a classic Japanese style known as chibi, which makes characters look super cute and childlike. It was almost like they turned her into a whole character, creating little comics of her hurting other cartoon characters in the same way she had done Satomi. It got so bad that the University of Nevada temporarily stopped selling their sweatshirts after a huge surge in sales. Since her release, many have tried to uncover her new identity and track her down, but so far, no one has been successful. To be honest, I hope they don't, and I hope that one day this whole trend stops. It's like everyone forgot that Natsumi isn't a fictional character and neither was Satomi. She really died, and it's pretty weird to me that someone could be a fan of that. Wherever Natsumi is, I hope that she was rehabilitated. Not necessarily for her sake, but for the safety of the people out there who don't know about her past, or what she is, or once was, capable of. What do you guys think of this case? Do you think Natsumi knows about her internet fame? As always, I can't wait to see what you think down in the comments below.